Course title, Arguing About Literature. Lecturer, Sammy Babak. Source, John's Chilburn John Clifford, A Brief Guide to Arguing About Literature, 2nd Edition. Thank you for your attendance. Don't forget to like and share the video. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell for more content to come. 5. How to Argue About Literature Why Study Literature in a College Writing Course? Much academic writing is, in fact, based on reading. Many classes will ask you to produce essays that analyze published texts. To analyze means going beyond your first impressions, carefully noting a text's ideas, techniques, and effects. You'll also find yourself needing to synthesize, that is, to trace how the text is patterned, as well as how it relates to other works. Together, these acts of analysis and synthesis have been called reading closely. Often, advanced courses will ask you to write about some text that isn't easily understood. The purpose of your paper will be to help other readers of the text grasp its meanings and, perhaps, judge its worth. Literature is a good training ground for these skills of interpretation and evaluation. Poems, stories, plays, and essays repeatedly invite inquiry. Some people dislike literature because they find it too vague and indirect. They resent that it often forces them to figure out symbols and implications when they would rather have ideas presented outright. But in life, truth can be complicated and elusive. In many ways, literature is most realistic when it suggests the same. Besides, many readers, perhaps including you, appreciate literature most when it resists simple decoding, forcing them to adopt new assumptions and learn new methods of analysis. We have been suggesting that one value of studying literature in a writing class is that it often engages not just thought but feeling. The two interweave so that readers find themselves engaging in interpretation and evaluation because they care about lives depicted in the text. Finally, writing about literature is good training for other fields because literary analysis often involves taking an interdisciplinary perspective. A typical interpretation of a single work or a pair of literary works will bring in principles of psychology to explain the speaker's distressed state of mind. To evaluate the character's condition, readers also grapple with philosophical questions about what constitutes a productive or good or free life. Moreover, gender roles, for instance, may have political, historical, and sociological significance. Remember that when you argue, you try to persuade an audience to accept your claims about an issue, working toward this aim by offering evidence, showing your reasoning, making assumptions, and employing other kinds of appeals. 6. Short Story with Sample Argumentative Essay The following story, Jamaica Kincaid's Girl, first appeared in The New Yorker in 1978 and was later reprinted in her first book, a 1984 collection of short stories titled At the Bottom of the River. Originally named Elaine Potter Richardson, Jamaica Kincaid, b. 1949, was born on the island of Antigua in the West Indies. At the time, Antigua was a British colony. Kincaid lived there until she was 17, when she emigrated to the United States. Soon she became a nanny for the family of Michael Aline, television critic for The New Yorker. Eventually, the magazine published her own short stories and during the early 1990s her gardening columns. Although she continues to live in the United States, almost all of her writing deals with her native land. In particular, she has written about Antiguan women growing up under British domination. She has published the novels Annie John, Lucy, Autobiography of My Mother, and Mr. Potter. Her books of non-fiction include A Small Place, An Analysis of Antigua, A Memoir, My Brother, My Garden, and Talk Stories, a collection of brief observations that she originally wrote for The New Yorker. In 2009, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is currently a professor of literature at Claremont McKenna College in California. Her latest novel is See Now Then. Jamaica Kincaid. Girl. Wash the white clothes on Monday and put them on the stone heap. Wash the color clothes on Tuesday and put them on the clothesline to dry. Don't walk barehead in the hot sun. Cook pumpkin fritters in very hot sweet oil. Soak your little clothes right after you take them off. When buying cotton to make yourself a nice blouse, be sure that it doesn't have gum on it, because that way it won't hold up well after a wash. Soak salt fish overnight before you cook it. Is it true that you sing Bina in Sunday school? Always eat your food in such a way that it won't turn someone else's stomach. On Sundays try to walk like a lady and not like the slut you are so bent on becoming. Don't sing Bina in Sunday school. You mustn't speak to war frat boys, not even to give directions. Don't eat fruits on the street. Flies will follow you. But I don't sing Bina on Sundays at all and never in Sunday school. This is how to sew on a button. 
This is how to make a buttonhole for the button you have just sewed on. This is how to hem a dress when you see the hem coming down and so to prevent yourself from looking like the slut I know you are so bent on becoming. This is how you eye on your father's khaki shirt so that it doesn't have a crease. This is how you eye on your father's khaki pants so that they don't have a crease. This is how you grow okra, far from the house, because okra tree harbors red ants. When you are growing dasheen, make sure it gets plenty of water or else it makes your throat itch when you are eating it. This is how you sweep a corner. This is how you sweep a whole house. This is how you sweep a yard. This is how you smile to someone you don't like too much. This is how you smile to someone you don't like at all. This is how you smile to someone you like completely. This is how you set a table for tea. This is how you set a table for dinner. This is how you set a table for dinner with an important guest. This is how you set a table for lunch. This is how you set a table for breakfast. This is how to behave in the presence of men who don't know you very well, and this way they won't recognize immediately the slut I have warned you against becoming. Be sure to wash every day, even if it is with your own spit. Don't squat down to play marbles, you are not a boy, you know. Don't pick people's flowers, you might catch something. Don't throw stones at blackbirds, because it might not be a blackbird at all. This is how to make a bread pudding. This is how to make dukona. This is how to make pepper pot. This is how to make a good medicine for a cold. This is how to make a good medicine to throw away a child before it even becomes a child. This is how to catch a fish. This is how to throw back a fish you don't like, and that way something bad won't fall on you. This is how to bully a man. This is how a man bullies you. This is how to love a man, and if this doesn't work there are other ways, and if they don't work don't feel too bad about giving up. This is how to spit up in the air if you feel like it, and this is how to move quick so that it doesn't fall on you. This is how to make ends meet. Always squeeze bread to make sure it's fresh. But what if the baker won't let me feel the bread? You mean to say that after all you are really going to be the kind of woman who the baker won't let near the bread? Number 1, Thinking about the text. Take into consideration the following questions while you are reading and annotating the text. 1. Is girl really a story? What characteristics of a story come to mind as you consider this issue? 2. Describe the culture depicted in girl as well as the role of females in that culture. Is either the culture or the role of females in it different from what you are familiar with? Explain. 3. Do you think that the instructions to this girl are all given on the same occasion? Why, or why not? Who do you suppose is giving the instructions? Would you say that the instructor is oppressive or domineering? Identify some of the assumptions behind your position. 4. What effect does Kincaid achieve by making this text a single long sentence? By having the girl speak at only two brief moments. 5. At one point, the girl is shown how to make a good medicine to throw away a child before it even becomes a child. What do you think of the instructor's willingness to give such advice? What do you conclude from its position in the text between how to make a good medicine for a cold and how to catch a fish? Does the order of the various pieces of advice matter? Could Kincaid have presented them in a different order without changing their effects? Number 2, the following essay demonstrates several of the strategies we have discussed. Its student author had read Kincaid's Girl in a course on composition and literature. Her assignment was to write an argument paper about a specific element of the story. She chose to raise an issue and develop a claim about its ending. Anne's chum what? English 102. The mother's mixed messages in Girl, in Jamaica Kincaid's story Girl, the speaker is evidently a mother trying to teach her daughter how to behave. The story is basically a single paragraph speech in which the mother gives various commands, instructions, and lessons, apparently in an effort at training her child to become what their culture considers a proper young woman. Only twice does the daughter herself interrupt the mother's monologue. It's interesting that the second break occurs near the end of the story. Right after the mother orders her to always squeeze bread to make sure it's fresh, the daughter asks, but what if the baker won't let me feel the bread? There is only one more sentence before the story concludes. The mother responds by asking, you mean to say that after all you are really going to be the kind of woman who the baker won't let near the bread? Notice here that the student writer refers to puzzled readers as a way of bringing up the main issue. The essay will help these readers with the closer look it receives to offer. Faced with this final exchange, many readers may wonder why author Kincaid chooses to make it the story's conclusion. It could have appeared earlier in the text, and Kincaid might have ended with any of the mother's statements that now come before it. This ending also feels inconclusive, for the very last words are a question that does not receive an answer. 
Notice here that the student writer introduces the essay's main issue. A cause and effect one. As a question. What, therefore, is Kincaid trying to emphasize with this puzzling finish? A closer look at its language, as well as at other words of the text, suggests that Kincaid is deliberately making us uncertain about whether the mother's stern training will indeed help her daughter become strong enough to survive in their society. Notice here that the student writer presents the essay's main claim. The mother may believe that she is providing sufficient survival skills, but Kincaid encourages readers to suspect that she is actually disempowering her daughter, not letting her develop the willpower she needs to endure. Notice here that the student writer Anne, because she is mainly concerned with the story's ending, she starts her paper with it rather than move chronologically through Kincaid's text. When the mother commands her daughter to squeeze the bread, probably she sees herself as pushing her to take charge of her life rather than meekly accept other people's treatment of her. To squeeze something is to perform a vigorous, self-assertive action, and in this case, it would involve testing the baker's product instead of just accepting it. Notice here that the student writer qualifies this statement rather than expressing it as an absolute fact. Earlier in the text, the mother offers a few other hints that she wishes the daughter to be aggressive, not passive. Notice here that the student writer draws evidence from the text's actual words. For example, she advises her on how to make a good medicine to throw away a child before it even becomes a child, on how to bully a man, and on how to spit up in the air if you feel like it. Notice here that the student writer acknowledges existence of another possible interpretation. A number of readers may infer, too, that even when she is telling the daughter how to perform household chores like washing, ironing, setting meals, and sweeping. A number of readers may infer, too, that even when she is telling the daughter how to perform household chores like washing, ironing, setting meals, and sweeping, she is fostering her independence by enabling her to handle basic demands of daily existence. Notice here how the student writer used pathos with the negatively emotional words presses, subservient, imprison, and dominate. Evidence then offered to support such language. But in crucial ways, the mother presses her daughter to play a subservient role in society. More specifically, she attempts to imprison her in a model of femininity that allows for men to dominate. Emphasizing that you are not a boy, you know, she demands that she try to walk like a lady and take care of her father's clothes. The various chores that she expects her daughter to perform would make life easier for the male head of the household. Moreover, they seem duties that a boy would not be required to fulfill. Notice here how the student author makes a reasonable assumption. Similarly, the mother hopes to restrict the daughter's sexual behavior. Repeatedly she warns her to prevent yourself from looking like the slut I know you are so bent on becoming. Notice here how the author states another in assumption, though qualified with the word perhaps. Again, it is doubtful that a boy would receive warnings like this. Like the United States, perhaps the culture reflected in this story even lacks a masculine equivalent of the derogatory term slut. Notice here how the student author makes concession. At the end, I admit, the mother seems to associate her daughter with an image of power. She implies that the girl should become the kind of woman whom the baker does let near the bread so that she can test it by squeezing it. But even here, actually, the mother does not envision her daughter as actively taking charge. In the scenario she sketches, the baker allows the girl to feel the bread. In order to touch it, she must get his permission, rather than straightforwardly exert her own authority. Moreover, she first has to be a certain sort of woman. Otherwise, she has not earned the right to examine his product. What type of woman is this? While some readers may argue that the mother wants her daughter to be an assertive female, many of the directions she has already given her would greatly limit her sphere of action, leaving her to be a relatively unadventurous housekeeping lady. Evidently the mother feels that the baker will give her daughter access to the bread only if she is a basically tame and polite version of womanhood. Notice how the word may not is a qualification, indicating that Anne is less than sure what the mother thinks. The mother may not realize that she is conveying mixed messages to her child. If we, as readers, take her to be hoping that her daughter becomes empowered and subservient, we may be spotting a contradiction that the mother herself is not conscious of. But the daughter may be aware of it. Perhaps the daughter is, in fact, now a grown-up woman who is trying to make sense of the paradoxical pieces of advice her mother gave her during her adolescence. The mother may have offered these supposed bits of wisdom at various different times, but the daughter is now remembering them all as one speech and struggling to figure out their implications. Notice here that even the text's punctuation may be significant. Kincaid's decision to conclude the story with a question mark may be her way of indicating that even in adulthood, 
The daughter still has not determined whether her mother wanted to liberate her or confine her. We can regard the daughter as someone who is still attempting to read her mother's intentions. As actual readers of this story, we would then be in the same position as she is, having to come up with our own interpretation of what her mother wanted her to do and be. Course title, Arguing About Literature. Lecturer, Sammy Babak. Source, John's Chilb and John Clifford, A Brief Guide to Arguing About Literature, 2nd Edition. Thank you for your attendance. Don't forget to like and share the video. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell for more content to come.